let me know a little about you know what you did did in the Navy and um, you know what you worked on and stuff like that, and that'll that'll kind of get us started. Okay, great. Okay. Um, during the uh, Gulf War, um, I, I was in the Navy. I enlisted as a sonar technician ground, which means that that I was on the surface of the water hunting for submarines um, from a ship. Uh, the, it could be a number of different ships. I was more, more trained on the equipment <clears throat> versus the vessel that I was on. Um, so th- I went to boot camp in San Diego there, and then I went to a school for when you learn about sonar acoustics. Um, I did that schooling for four months. And then before I was released, um, I was activated. I had enlisted as a reservist for college and I was activated. So I spent almost a year on active duty uh, stationed in in California, though I never actually uh, was deployed anywhere. Um, and during that time, we learned about uh, how to use the uh, the sonar dome and all the equipment associated with uh, with sonar, which is pr- pretty diverse. It's it's not just the uh, the the front of the ship or the microphones towards the rear, but there's also um, a lot of different equipment. Some some's deployed from the air, some's deployed from from the ship. There's sonar buoys. There's a lot of different methods of tracking and determining uh, sound underwater. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, it sounds, uh, well, other than the sound and anything like that, I mean, I know it works on a very similar um, principle to radar, and that, that, of course, is what I did in the Air Force. So, But um, obviously, we could not pick up sounds with the radar, <laughs> so a little bit different. So in your, uh, in your uh, occupation with the Navy, was that something that required you to have a security clearance? Yes. Um, I had a, a, a secret clearance uh in the navy and that's why i can't tell you about the equipment that i worked on or the even the uh even my office i couldn't even really go into details about on because of that clearance okay yeah and i understand that and and i definitely don't want to ask you to break that security clearance for sure in the job um would make you consider that what you did do there um might be related to flat earth in some way um, <clears throat> during my time in the Navy, it never once occurred to me that there could be any other possibility that we would have to have lived on a ball earth. So it, it was, wasn't in the purview of anyone around me. It was just never even something ever talked about. Um, there's nothing in the, uh, literature that I read that told me one way or the other, but in hindsight, this is all in hindsight it's only when I look back that I can tell you that that everything that we've done to measure sound, everything that we do right now uh, in the open market, things that I can talk about, you know, the actual passive acoustic equipment that's available or the active sonar equipment that's available, all of them uh, do rely on the concept of, of a flat earth, even though they don't explicitly say that. Um, mm-hmm. th- there's even some specific equipment that, that I simply just can't talk about, but it, it, it really does only in hindsight <laughs> do I realize this would only work if, if we're living in a flat environment. In fact, all of our charts were based off that. Right. Yeah. And that, that doesn't surprise me at all because so were there the radar charts that, uh, we worked off of. So in sonar, um, obviously if you're in a submarine or something like that, what what kind of ranging did you have? I mean, how far away could you actually detect targets with the sonar? Well, technically, you could hear a target for as far away as, say, a thousand miles. Wow. It's gonna, yeah, it's going to depend on the. There's a so far. There is a channel. You, you might you might be familiar with this because I the same thing exists in the in the uh, the troposphere. I think. I mean, uh, in the atmosphere, uh, there is a channel where the pressure causes sound to move slower than anywhere else. And underwater, that's met through pressure, temperature, salinity. There's a, you know, an optimal curve there, which actually causes a slowdown of sound as sound passes through that so far channel. So that channel acts as a a sort of an underwater internet for whales, for really anything. Anyone who wants to communicate underwater could pump their sound into that so far channel and it's going to travel for thousands of miles. Um, to me, that alone is a flat earth proof. Um, th- there is a, uh, a consequence of sound being wrapped around a donut 
versus sound being able to just permeate straight. Um, however, it's not exact enough where I've gotten in enough arguments with people where I can't just like flip this card over and go, ha ha, see here, <laughs> right. here's the perfect proof for that. So, so that's, that's just one element of, of underwater acoustics. Um, there's really two types of sonar. There's an active sonar and a passive sonar. And so in, in active mode, you would be sending a pulse or a signal or an oscillation out from your transducer and then listening for the time it took for that pulse to get back. That would give you a very active, uh, not only vector of where your target is, but more specifically, it would give you a distance and a range. And that's really is what's crucial um, for underwater. Meanwhile, on passive side, all you can really do is detect a vector of where something's coming from. You can't really range it from there. But, but the primary meat, the, the stake that I'm bringing to this conversation is that there is something called acoustic shadows. And these acoustic shadows, I, I'm sure there's the same thing in the radar. There are radar shadows where if you're hitting a, a direct target, anything behind that target is going to be blind. And it's just... Simply, it would be the easiest thing in the world for um, submarines to hide over the curve. I, I don't see how any they would ever be able to be found simply because they could uh, stay low enough on the bottom where there's always a hump of earth between them and the person trying to hunt them. Ah, so essentially anything over, say, 10 to 15 miles, which would give you, you know, 60 to 100 foot plus of curvature, theoretically, um, that would they would be in that blind spot for the sonar. Exactly. And what I'm quoting here, just to this is all standard. You can Google this and look it up. This is just you know how any kind of underwater submarine you would buy off the market. You know their sonar equipment, or if you were to build your own. This is just how transducers work. Yeah, there's going to be shadows, and you're going to be blind behind those shadows. And a hill or a hump at the bottom would be that giant shadow. Okay. Wow. You know, that's, that's very interesting. I never thought about anything like that before. Yeah. yeah so 60, it looks like 60 miles is it, man. So if you got this going maybe 60, maybe 75 miles at the outset, and I'm, we're going to assume that the, the, the classified information is a little bit more than that. And I'm just assuming you have told nothing. Um, <laughs> so even uh, assuming you could go down uh, much further than that, still, still the math indicates that uh, it, it, you would not have a vessel that you should be able to detect uh, further than about 75 miles away. So that's really interesting, and that is something I have never, ever, ever considered before. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> if sonar is actually working essentially on a line of sight uh, type of basis, then then it would be like one sub to another uh, you shouldn't be able to detect much more than about 75 miles absolute max. That's assuming a 20, 2,500 foot crush depth. So based on those numbers, yeah. And obviously, I'm sure it might even be longer than that. So like I said, I'm just throwing out numbers here based on what the math is telling me. But uh, that's very, very interesting. I, I, I think that the uh, the acoustic shadows, though, even once you're on the shelf, really does show that that, well, why are we able to find things? Um, we find things all the time and, uh, we're finding them with sonar and it seems like it would be a whole lot harder if, if we were dealing with a curve also. Right. Tell, just out of curiosity, tell me the difference between active and passive sonar. So active sonar is you're sending out a pulse. And since you're sending, since you're the originator of the sound, you know exactly what time you sent it. You know, mm -hmm. and because of that, you now are able to uh, reverse engineer the passive sonar, which is listening. That's just simply listening. You're able to then reverse engineer. You know, I said, hey, 10 seconds ago and here I just got it back. And because of that, now you can really track in and dig in on that vector and you'll know exactly how far away something is. In other words, you're, you're able to hear all kinds of stuff. And for all you know, some things could be coming from you know, a thousand miles away if they're in that, that so far stream, exactly. like you mentioned. Okay. But when you go active, um, you're sending a pulse out, you're starting a coherent oscillator, timing it just like radar, exactly how radar works. And you're timing that, that pulse to return to you. And based on the Doppler effect, then you are able to calculate its distance and uh, uh, also speed, 
uh, you know, ping it a couple times, you can extrapolate the speed as well. Yeah. It really does only in hindsight <laughs> do I realize this would only work if, if we're living in a flat environment. In fact, all of our charts were based off that. 